This yeah. is absolutely it's, bizarre to me that you can't talk about justification anymore in yeah. these denominations. Yeah. Yeah. You can decide exactly Global how, warming. how the United States should fall out on any number of public policy yeah. issues yeah. that have absolutely not a shred of exegetical support underneath it. And it's left and it's right. Yeah. It's nutty is what it is. On this edition of the White Horse Inn, a discussion of political temptations. White Horse Inn, know what you believe and why you believe it. Five centuries ago, in taverns and public houses across Europe, the masses would gather for discussion and debate over the latest ideas sweeping the land. From one such meeting place, a small Cambridge inn called the White Horse, the Reformation came to the English-speaking world. Carrying on the tradition of the early reformers, welcome to the White Horse Inn. Hello and welcome to another broadcast of the White Horse Inn with Kim Riddlebarger, Rod Rosenblatt, Ken Jones, and I'm Mike Horton. We're talking in this broadcast about political temptations. It's part of that distraction from Christ and Him crucified. Looking away from Jesus Christ has been a perennial temptation throughout church history. The Pharisees were so distracted by their campaign to reestablish the Old Covenant theocracy that they missed the Messiah when He actually appeared. Most of those who were crying Hosanna to the son of David in regal celebration as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday were crying crucify him, crucify him on Good Friday. For those looking for nothing more than national commitment to biblical morality and driving out the Romans, Jesus was certainly a great disappointment. Ironically, on the road to Emmaus, soon after his resurrection, Jesus caught up with two of his disciples who were still deeply disillusioned. We thought he was the one who would redeem Israel, they said, not realizing that he just had redeemed Israel on a much grander scale than they had room for in their limited horizon of expectation. Looking away from Christ has been easy for Christians, too, especially when the supposedly Christian emperor fancies himself Christ in absentia. Before long, popes were also Christ's visible substitutes. The whole of Europe was simply Christendom, the Holy Roman Empire complete with its crusading knights who assumed the role of David's warriors defending the city of God. Today there are many Christians who still pine for a supposedly Christian America as the latest incarnation of Christ. And since 2008 is an election year, many churches will have even more opportunity to be distracted. But Christ only had one incarnation. It was over 2,000 years ago in Palestine born in a barn with humble earthly witnesses rather than in a palace attended by a royal staff, Jesus was born to live a life of perfect love and holiness for us, to bear our sentence on the cross, and to be raised the third day for our justification. It's easy to miss this Jesus if we're not careful just because we were looking for something more spectacular. How does our obsession with turning America into Zion contribute to Christless Christianity? What do we mean when we talk about the doctrine of the two kingdoms? What happens when we confuse them? And how do we come to confuse them so obviously in a land so committed to the separation of church and state? Does our faith have anything to do with parties, candidates, and platforms? Political distractions, that's our subject on this edition of the White Horse Inn as we wind up our introduction to the theme for 2008, Challenging Christless Christianity. First of all, guys, are we confusing Christ and his kingdom with uh, with America today? Here's a, That's a softball. <laughs> <laughs> that's the great temptation of the age, yes. Yeah, I think probably along with uh, the confusion of law and gospel, the confusion of the two kingdoms are probably the two greatest hurdles and problems yeah, uh, yeah. in the contemporary yeah. church. Agreed. Um, remember back in 2001, after the uh, September 11th terrorist attacks, in the National Cathedral Service in Washington, there was a parade of the honor guard of the armed forces to the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And then President Bush declared that it was his cause to, uh, or the cause of the United States to rid the world of evil. Uh, a senator announced that the events of 9-11 have reinforced the view that America is a sacred nation. Hmm. Billy Graham said that uh, this is going to produce a revival. Mm -hmm. It certainly did 
produce a revival, a new wave of nationalism that w- at least lasted for a while. Uh, on the other hand, precisely because of its sacred covenant, according to Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, the horrible tragedy was God's judgment on his nation for tolerating abortion and homosexuality. Yeah. More recently, in a book titled God's Judgments, Interpreting History and the Christian Faith, uh, published by InterVarsity Press, another evangelical, Stephen Kaler, explains why he thinks that 9-11 was God's judgment for America's greed, free trade policies, and militarism. So everyone seems to think that America has this most favored nation status and that his blessings can be directly correlated to America doing the right thing and uh, uh, dangers being the result of America's broken covenant with God. How did all this happen? How did we get By the way, let's not forget forget the worship service that was held in the immediate aftermath of... of, uh, At Yankee Stadium. No, at the National Cathedral. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. 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 Even a name like National Cathedral is the infusion of kingdoms. I was going to say, the very title of the building indicates the two kingdoms are thoroughly confused. There should be the Anglican Cathedral in Washington, Mm D.C., period. Right. Tell me what you think of this, Is if this is right. It seems like we went from the stage, first of all, of allegorizing the story of Israel into the story of European civilization with Christendom. Yes, yes. And uh, then did that with the rise of nation states, with the breakup of the Roman Empire, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither Holy Roman or, or an empire. The, the, <laughs> the breakup of Christendom, you had the rise of of Christian nations, Mm -hmm. and those nation states claimed a favored status, despite the fact that the Reformation and the confessions of Reformed and Lutheran traditions said that the Old Covenant and the theocracy were now obsolete. You still had Protestant kings and rulers and prime ministers (laughs) claiming that their nation was in covenant with God. Mm Mm-hmm. So when, for instance, Britain met the Spanish Armada and defeated it, though it seemed as if the Spanish had the upper hand, of course it was attributed to God as uh, Christ was trampling the serpent, Rome, the Roman Antichrist. This confusion of national successes and failures with biblical prophecy has been going on for a long time, but now we've moved from allegorizing that story, which means no longer interpreting it in its historical context, but stepping into it as mm-hmm. if it's clothes that we could just put on ourselves. Yeah, yeah. We've gone from allegorizing it to secularizing it. So now manifest destiny, mm-hmm. just some vague sense that America has a mission in the world, is a secularized version of this global spreading of the kingdom of God through national expansion. Well, there's a whole bunch of things packed in there. One is probably the loss of a doctrine of providence. It would seem to be many evangelicals confuse providence and redemption. So while you could make a case that the United States has served a very important role in God's providence in restraining evil such as Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan and things like that, where we have been used as God's agent to basically pound the beast when it's appeared a couple of times. We confuse that with redemption, that somehow our cause is righteous because God has used us providentially. Mm. I think we've got to keep those two things very, very, mm-hmm. very distinct. Especially when God, in the scriptures, used Assyria and Assyria. Babylon. Yeah. 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 Providentially. And that's, and that's, uh, that's, how yeah. we, that's how we have to view the United States, as occupying that kind of a role as a great nation that God uses to keep other nations in check. And that means that our nation is one of those nations that's equally sinful and equally fallen. Yeah. So we have to we have to take redemption out of the equation when it comes to the United States. I also think we have to make the case, or at least look at the point, that there's no doubt that the United States has supported more missionaries and sent more money to... Co- I mean, there, a lot of the, the prosperity that God has given us providentially has been used by Christians mm-hmm. for very worthwhile and good things. Mm-hmm. So if you keep that distinct from redemption, look at it in terms of providence, then I think you can say that, that the United States has been used mightily of God sure. if you're talking about those kinds of things. If you don't have a distinction between redemption and providence, then it becomes America is a Christian nation kicking out the Amalekites. Yep. Yes. And that's what you can't say. Yes. Yeah. Boy, that's that's so clearly stated, Kim. Um, 
and that's that's what's missing. People won't. Uh, they will immediately go to. Boy, that's that's so clearly stated, Kim. Um, and that's that's what's missing. People won't. Uh, they will immediately go to, like you mentioned, <clears throat> the things that have certainly been used by God for the furtherance of the gospel um, throughout the world in, in missions and evangelism. And and it's it's ergo, we are therefore the new Israel. We are, yeah. you know, the city on that's the hill. That's the leap you can't make. No. We're going to talk in a moment about the biblical uh, support for this doctrine of two kingdoms, that Christ's kingdom and the kingdoms of this world are things distinct. We have a dual citizenship. But before we get there, it's interesting that although that doctrine is especially identified with Luther and also Calvin, as we'll see uh, in just a moment, that even in Scandinavia, this is the, the king of Sweden, uh, put Bible verses on the on the canons mm. uh, that he shot at Catholic countries. You had the Catholic League. That's nice. <laughs> versus the Protestant League, and so the religious wars between nations became a right. war between denominations. Mm. And then you have the Puritans coming to New England and setting up what they called a Holy Commonwealth, mm -hmm. which again is a confusion of the kingdoms. Isn't it strange that? Despite the very clear teaching, not only of the reformers, but of the Lutheran and Reformed confessions on this point, that nations continued to grab the mantle of Christendom yeah. just as, as yeah. they had before the Reformation. It's always been hard for a Christian people to live in the midst of those who persecute them and those who try and uh, deceive them, like Israel back in Canaan with the Canaanites. You know, still residing nearby and always being pulled toward Baalism and, and Ashtoreth and all. Christians, I think, have a, have a sense of self-preservation by wanting to congregate together and formulating a government that protects them yeah. and that manifests some kind of civic righteousness. And a lot of times that goal is so easily tweaked to include the church as somehow connected to the state. And that's how, you, on the one hand, you want to... You, I would like to live in a community where people were of like mind and where the things I thought were important were protected and honored. Yes. And, and there's a real attraction to that. And, and you'd want to go, you know, take over Vancouver Island and make it the, the reformed, you know, Canton. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a part of me that would like to do that. Didn't they do that in Grand Rapids? No, uh. try. Yeah. <laughs> Yet on the other hand, just the very idea that we want to do that shows a little bit of our sinful, sinful propensity to be afraid of the world and to be reluctant to exercise our role as salt and light in the world around us where not everybody is on the same page where there are pagans are living next door to me where their ideology is constantly before my eyes and i have to constantly work and respond against it and it's but, also but, a collective narcissism to, to say probably. i want you know yeah. uh separate just, from, just a reformed community just a lutheran yeah. community just a I mean, isn't there a lot of narcissism sure. in that too? We like to to two tables of the law. We yeah. will always we will always it will always manifest itself in our interactions with with others, whether yeah. it's denominationally, whether it's ethnically, culturally, whatever. Yeah. We, yeah. we want to yeah. be yeah. like with those who are like us. You're listening to the White Horse Inn, and we're discussing the question of political temptation, especially now that we've entered a new election year. We'll be back right after this break. Welcome back to the White Horse Inn. I'm Michael Horton, and we're talking about political temptation. It's really interesting, looking back at the, the history of it, without going into all kinds of uh, examples, just a, a couple here, how the shining city on, the, on a hill, that, that ideal of America as this, this holy commonwealth, really attracted Anglicans, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Quakers, a whole variety of uh, of different people, so that the co colonies really became united, in part at least, around this notion of not only a holy commonwealth, but a, of a holy nation. Right, right. Well, remember, in, in fairness to those folks, they all have been persecuted in their home before they left. So there, sure. there, there's a sense in which they're coming... Which and, you'd and think would make haven. them even more nervous yes, but, about... Exactly, but instead <laughs> it just makes them more vulnerable to... Allying with other Christians and seeking to have a quote unquote Christian secular, secular government. Yeah, the New the New England Puritans, you know, supposedly came over for uh, for po political liberty so that they could worship God quote unquote in freedom. Mm -hmm. But 
they wanted to worship God according to his word, is what they said. And uh-huh. Baptists, for example, didn't worship God according to his word. They didn't mm-hmm. baptize yeah. infants and include... So Roger Williams and yeah. other Calvinistic Baptists were exiled from Massachusetts. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Was it Rhode Island? Rhode Island. Yeah, to, there we yeah go. to Rhode yeah. Island from yeah. Massachusetts. Yeah. So it's a remarkable thing. To, to be disciplined in church is one thing. Quite yes, proper yeah. for a church to do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to to be exiled from the state is yes. quite a another thing. Here is okay, so some examples. Samuel Sherwood, seventeen thirty to seventeen eighty three he lived. He preached a sermon uh, on January seventeenth, seventeen seventy six that quite literally rallied the revolutionary troops with a sermon whose title tells this story. Try to put this on a bulletin. <laughs> the church's flight into the wilderness an address on the times hmm. containing some very interesting and important observations on scripture prophecies showing that sundry of them plainly relate to Great Britain and the American colonies and are fulfilling in the present day the lion was with it, its cubs yeah. mm-hmm. was it was there some of that british british, british israelite yeah. stuff in yeah. there yeah. Huh? Using well, here is what he says: using Revelation 12 as his text, with patriots like John Hancock uh, in the congregation. He'd be sitting here listening to this. Sherwood thundered that Rome, the dragon, the headquarters of tyranny and persecution. This is an Anglican, by the way. Hmm. They didn't usually rally their parishioners to the revolutionary cause, but. <laughs> <laughs> Rome, the dragon, the headquarters of tyranny and persecution, still persecutes the true saints, as is true in France and other popish countries. And such tyranny is apparent also in Great Britain, which has become increasingly favorable to popery crushing liberty. There is now no part of the earth where learning, religion, and liberty have flourished more for the time than in the American wilderness. And then he adds this. It is not likely nor probable that God will revoke the grant he has made of this land to his church. That's wow. the error right yeah, there. there it is. That's the error. His gifts as well as calling are irrevocable. Uh, that's These the commotions and convulsions in the British Empire may be leading to the fulfillment of such prophecies as relate to his Babylon's downfall and overthrow mm. yeah. and to the future glory and prosperity of Christ's church. It will soon be said and acknowledged that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our mm. Lord and of Ooh, his Christ. He's post-millennial. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's the Harvard president and Congregationalist Minister Samuel Langdon before the New Hampshire General Court in 1788. Harvard's president, the, the title is The Republic of the Israelites, an Example to the American States. Text, Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 through 8. If I am not mistaken, instead of the 12 tribes of Israel, we may substitute the 13 states of the American oh. Union and oh. see this application Ooh. plainly offering itself. I always love it when they say plain. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> obvious or it's plain. You know they're hiding yeah. <laughs> the fact that it's not. That as God, in the course of his kind providence, hath given you an excellent constitution of government, founded on his most rational, equitable, and liberal principles, by which all that liberty is secured which a people can reasonably claim, and you are empowered to make righteous laws for promoting public order and good morals, and as he has moreover given you by his Son Jesus Christ, who is far superior to Moses, a complete revelation of his will, and a perfect system of true religion, plainly delivered in the sacred writings. It will be your wisdom in the eyes of the nations, he's telling this to the court, the New Hampshire General Court, and your true interest and happiness to conform your practice in the strictest manner to the excellent principles of your government, adhere faithfully to the doctrines and commands of the gospel, and practice every public and private virtue. By this you will increase in numbers, wealth, and power, and obtain reputation and dignity among the nations, whereas the contrary conduct will make you poor, distressed, and... The last one I'll mention is, uh, on July 4th, 1798, Yale President Timothy Dwight preached a sermon in which he calculated the year in accord with the vials of Revelation 16, in scrupulous detail, the last of which has, quote, been in operation more than 100 years. And then he offers a detailed uh, defense of his calculations. Quote, 
Look through the history of your country. You will find scarcely less glorious and wonderful proofs of divine protection and deliverance uniformly administered through every period of our existence as a people than shown to the people of Israel and Egypt in the wilderness and in Canaan. Wow. Wow. Progress is everywhere afoot. Jews given citizenship in Prussia. Austrians embracing the Sabbath. England, Scotland, Germany. Well, there you go right there. (laughs) (laughs) England, Scotland, Germany, and the United States sending missionaries throughout the world. And measures enlarging for putting an end to the African slavery, which will, within a moderate period, bring it to an end. Islam is being pushed back, and Catholic countries are being judged by various calamities. Hmm. Talk about, you you say this all the time, Kim, reading the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Boy. Well, and Timothy Dwight's uh, forefather there, Jonathan Edwards, Mm -hmm. had set a date of 1866 for the Lord to return. So it's in the genes there. This has been going for a long time. It's been going for a long time. We've been doing this for a while now. This is nothing new. And by the way, if the end of slavery is the proof of God's God's favor upon America, how about the initiation of slavery by the same people? What does that say? Well, and these guys, of course, didn't foresee the American Civil War either. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, after Charles Finney, this doesn't get any better. Yeah. He said the church is just a moral reform society. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're heirs today. Whatever is being done on the evangelical left and the evangelical right today, they're both heir to this legacy, not only of Charles Finney, but before yeah. Charles Finney, the legacy of people who claim to be in Reformation traditions right. who well, the, couldn't the, distinguish the two kingdoms. The heir, as you point out, Mike, is not in the, in the, the, the identification of the persecutor. They get that right. Mm-hmm. That in, in the case of, of Rome, you have uh, the Pope and the Prince in league to be able to send armies to attack and kill and repress those preaching the gospel. I mean, that's why the reformers identified the papacy as Antichrist, because they saw all the signs, and the signs were present, only it wasn't in the province of God the time for the final revelation of the of the end. But where in the book of Revelation do you get, before Christ returns, the saints mounting a campaign well, that's against just it. the beast? Mm-hmm. Where, you, where, you, where you get the error is the identification with the United States as the national chart of the Holy Land, as opposed to all those references to the persecutor in the scripture are re- referring to the persecution of God's people as the church, right. not mm-hmm. as a nation. Right. And they're martyred. And, and they're yeah. martyred, exactly. <laughs> now, to return to the issue that I raised earlier, as you mentioned, the, the, the responsibility to do justice, to rule and govern in a just manner. Uh-huh. Obviously, it would be great if you had Christians who have a Christian worldview that not in the name of the church, but in the name of the state, occupied those positions as judges or as president or governor I'm not or whatever. even sure of that anymore. No, well, I, I agree. But in principle, <laughs> right, in principle, right. if, a, yeah. if a person understood the scriptures in a proper way, it would be good if you had Christians in those positions. It's a doctrine of vocation. But, but here's the problem. Most Christians think you have that, that Christian, it, you have to be a Christian. In other words, if you are not a Christian, then therefore somehow if your worldview is different, then you are not qualified to rule or to govern or to be a judge. Well, and, and that's where it's problematic. Well, Luther, what Luther said, if I have to choose between a Christian who doesn't get justice and a Jew who does, I'm going to elect the Jew. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I, he threw yeah. it right out there on the table. Well, it would be the same in our... It, the distinction for us would be, will you swear to preserve, defend, and uphold the Constitution? That's that's what's required for somebody serving in the city right. of man. Right, And it doesn't matter whether they're a pagan, whether they're a secularist, that's whether they're right. a Muslim, whether they're a Jew, or whether they're an evangelical Christian. On the one, as a minister of the gospel, I swear allegiance to the Reformed faith, as, uh, which summarizes the scripture. That's my charter as a minister of the gospel. As a citizen, I don't take an oath to swear and uphold the Constitution because I'm not called to a civic vocation. Right. But as a voter, sure, I mm-hmm. vote for people who do, and I don't yeah. vote for people who don't. Right. Does right. that help? Is that yeah? Well, it it does. But what we hear from Christian radio programs, talk shows, and publications around election time is that you begin with the person's religious conviction. So if a person has no religious affiliation, most of the time in Christian media, they are vilified simply because of their lack of of, of church affiliation or Christian profession. This is because people, people think 
that the point of the Bible is to give us a blueprint yep, yep, for right. every aspect of life. I, I'm getting so tired of this yes. Christian worldview yes. stuff. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, the Bible does not give us a Christian view of everything. Right. The Bible gives us a Christian outlook on life. Yes, a Christian outlook on more than the atonement. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Right. right. We see things in the light of the age to come. Yes, mm -hmm. all of that. Yes, yes. But it doesn't give us anything concrete about policy on foreign diplomacy. There's no Christian view of states' rights versus federalism. Right, right, right. 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 And in fact, here's what, here's what you find. You don't find a blueprint that the, uh, the evangelical left or evangelical right could uh, draw on. Here's what you find. Jesus famously declaring, Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. Paul echoes, let everyone be subject mm -hmm. to the governing authorities, for there is no authority <clears throat> except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. The, yep. the secular officer, he says, does not bear the sword in vain, but is in fact a minister of God in that secular sphere. And he's speaking of Rome, Rome, the Roman Empire that had already persecuted and, and killed Christians. Yeah. Render, therefore, says Paul, uh, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And he goes on and says, you know, here's how you need to live in the last days. Oh, okay, good. Here Now, here, this is going to be the blueprint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. here it comes. And he says... Uh, Mind your own business. Yeah. Work with work, your hands. Work well yeah. with your hands yeah. so that you may uh, win the respect of outsiders and have something to give to those in need. Yep. Anything else? Yeah. yeah. Okay, you may go now. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, and Peter does the same thing. Yeah, he says, Peter you know, does how, also. how should you live uh, in these last days? Yeah. Well, by being submissive to those who have rule over. Here are a couple of examples I want to hear your comments on. This is... Uh, from the uh, Presbyterian Church USA, I thought I would, I would compare two denominations. The first is the Presbyterian Church USA. Recent General Assembly and several General Assemblies since uh, 2004 have been working very hard on resolving comprehensive legalization programs for immigrants to decide domestic policy, not as to how the church is going to help and the care for and the mm -hmm. poor and needy, including immigrants, but creating public policy with the coercion of the state behind it. We elect state and federal officials to make those determinations. Yep. The resolution includes opposition to walls, an addition of more agents on the border, a guest worker program with a path to permanent residency, and calls upon the denomination to encourage Presbyterian legislators serving in the House and Senate actively to work across party lines to defeat <sighs> This proposed legislation, while actively working across party lines to achieve more uh, amicable legislation that resolves the conflicts surrounding immigration policy issues. Then, oh. I came across the denomination's uh, decision with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They have made a de uh, very, very strict uh, determinations about how that should go. And then... Um, what do they have to say on the new perspective? Yeah, nothing. Nothing. Oh, okay. Yeah, nothting particularly of a theological nature. Oh, what? Okay. I'm get sorry. a hold of yourself, Ken. <laughs> it's a church. The uh, <laughs> the the Presbyterian Church USA has weighed in on NAFTA and CAFTA, opposing free trade in principle. That's Hezekiah chapters twelve and thirteen. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Oh gosh. And then the World Alliance of Reformed Churches, of which the Peace USA is a member, decided recently, quote that working to create a more just economy is essential to the integrity of Christian faith. I mean, that goes right back to that Josiah yeah, Strong yeah, comment, exactly Christianizing the, the, the uh, economy. economy. But, not to be outdone, the Southern Baptist Convention has offered resolutions of this kind as well on the other side of the political aisle. This comes from the convention in June 2003 on the liberation of Iraq. Notice the name of it, first of all, on the liberation of Iraq. Whereas we believe Operation Iraqi Freedom was a warranted action based upon historical principles of just war, now therefore be it resolved that the messengers to the Southern Baptist Convention meeting in Phoenix, Arizona, 2003, affirm President George W. Bush, the United States Congress, and our armed forces for their leader leadership in the successful execution of Operation Iraqi Freedom. 
the messengers call on the United States government and the international community to ensure that the Iraqi people enjoy all the blessings of liberty, including economic, political, and religious freedom. Then in 1988, the convention included a resolution on exportation of alcohol and tobacco, condemning U.S. government support of international markets for alcohol and tobacco, quote, be it resolved that we encourage the United States government to cease to d assist these industries via trade talks. And Southern Baptists declare their opposition to these hypocritical practices by the United States government on behalf of the alcohol and tobacco industries. In 2007, the same body issued a resolution on global warming because, of course, it's a body of, of scientific yeah. training. That's in Hezekiah 14. <laughs> After listing no fewer than 19 reasons for contesting the, oh. the, war the warning that global warming constitutes a, a catastrophic human-induced challenge, the messengers passed the following resolution, which had a lot to do with interpreting CO2 emissions, of which... A, That's Hezekiah 15. Yeah, <laughs> of which a, a, a denomination is so credibly uh, competent You're right. to address. So if, we, if, if a person opposes either one of those positions, does that make them either un-American or non-Christian? Which, which well, is it? That's the question. This yeah. is absolutely it's, bizarre to me that you can't talk about justification anymore yeah. in these denominations. Yeah. But yeah. You can decide exactly <laughs> Global how, <warming. laughs> how the United States should fall out on any number of public policy well, issues yeah. that have absolutely absolutely not a shred of exegetical support underneath it. And it's left and it's right. Yeah. It's nutty is what it is. Yeah, it's Folks, we're being distracted. Yes. Yeah. This is not to say that a Christian... Right, here's what we do in our tradition. Just We'll net it out for you as we got to wind this thing up. When we talk about the church, we're talking about the ministry of word and sacrament, not everything that Christians are called to do. Yeah. We're talking about what the ministers and elders and deacons are called to do. That's what we're talking about and what the Christians are called to receive. And those things we are to be of one mind. Yes. And then as we are built up into one body, we are equipped as Christians. We go out on Monday to be scattered into the world as salt and light. That is when we talk about vocations, mm -hmm. not the church and its work, but secular vocations and their legitimate place in God's economy. What we've seen here is a confusion of kingdoms where the church, that body entrusted with the Great Commission, tries to do the work of Christians in their secular callings, mm -hmm. the cultural mandate. This is a blatant confusion of kingdoms and folks it's going to happen again this year as we approach the, the political yep. season Oops. on both sides of the political aisle it is going to happen again and again please let us resist that temptation political temptations we're going to see a lot of those this mm. political season and uh, we hope that you will not be distracted from Christ uh, be a good citizen and uh, also faithfully attend to God's word and let the church be the church. Let the state be the state. We look forward to being with you again next week on the White Horse Inn. For more information about the things you heard on today's program, head to whitehorseinn.org. There you'll find links to relevant articles from our magazine, Modern Reformation, as well as book recommendations and other resources. The address again is whitehorseinn.org. That's whitehorseinn.org. We'll see you again next week at the White Horse Inn.